turn with me to uh, Joshua chapter 1. You can, we'll start there. I'm going to start before there. And as you know, Isaiah 14 says, Hallow gate, cry, O city, for thou art dissolved, O Palestina. Dissolved. It means no more. What shall we tell the nations? The Lord has founded Zion. Keep that in mind. It's prophetic. It's God's prophetic word. It's God's will. And we need to obey him and hold fast to his plans and his purposes. I don't know anybody who doesn't want to be successful. What is our definition of successful? Someone might immediately say, well, if I have a lot of money. Well, that's financially successful, but that doesn't mean you'll be socially successful, medically successful, or as far as health, emotionally successful. There are plenty of people with a lot of money that commit suicide. You might say, well, uh, to be successful in, uh, I, I, is to go to church every week. Well, it's good to go to church every week. You should be in the house of the Lord. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But if you can't pay your bills, uh, that's not necessarily successful either. Success in God is every need supplied. God's will is that every need is supplied. So we first of all see that we have what we need when we need it, financially. We're not scraping it together to try to make ends meet. We're not fearful of how we're going to pay the bills. No, we have what we need. Same thing with our health. Our health is strong. We do everything we can to promote good health in our bodies, mentally as well. And so today, we're going to be talking about success in life. And the Lord says in 3 John, verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things, and let's put this in perspective, the Holy Spirit is saying, above everything else, above all things, that you may prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. It's predicated, the prosperity is predicated upon our mind, our will, our emotions, the soul. Is our mind stable or is our mind unstable? Are we emotionally stable or are we up and down and all around? The Word of God says we should have the mind of Christ. Jesus was not an emotional wreck. Jesus was not up one day and down the next. He was stable, emotionally stable, mentally. And we are to grapple with that in our lives to establish the stability of Christ in our minds, for we have the mind of Christ. And we've not received the spirit of fear, but love of power and a sound mind. Sound means it doesn't go to pieces. We don't cave. We don't fall apart at the first bad news that comes our way. Psalm 112 says, I'll not be afraid of evil tidings. My heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord, which if we reverse, if our heart is not fixed, we're afraid of evil tidings. If we cave and crash and burn because of evil tidings, our heart's not fixed, trusting in the Lord. I'll not be afraid of evil tidings. That's worry. That's fear. That's going to hinder our, our prospering. Now, success in life, we'll go back to Joshua now. What does it say there? Joshua 1.8, one of my favorite scriptures, as I tell you, all my scriptures are favorite scriptures. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Book of the law means law. And by the way, we're coming up to November and we're going to be coming up to elections. And I don't want you to vote Democrat or Republican. We should not be voting party. We should be no voting God's word. And it begins here with law. There is law. In God's word, this book of the law. So we want, we want people in power that obey the law and that adhere to the law and keep the law. We don't want lawlessness at the highest levels. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. We should be speaking the word of God. Good times, bad times, prayer times, other times. Speaking the word of God, speaking the promises of God, speaking the love of God. How many words, if we were to categorize our words on a daily basis, how many words do we speak on a daily basis? All right, guys, we'll start with you because you speak a lot less words, and so it's easier to categorize the guys' words. We just have a few words each day. Ladies, that's a different story. I think, wasn't it one of the apostle writers who said if we should write all the things that Jesus did, the world wouldn't be able to contain enough books? Well, think about that in terms of speaking. 
and we we tend guys tend to not speak a whole lot. Ladies, anybody who's been married more than you know a day or so, you know that. You we have that. things to say. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> we have many things to say. We got many. <laughs> Operative word is many, many things to say. And we have some things to hear. So <laughs> that's why most of our speaking is uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Guys, we have that phrase cornered. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And you can always say uh-huh without hearing a word, can't you? I mean, just, you know, that's, it's like the, the Peanuts cartoons. You hear in the background, wah, 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 wah. And all you do is say uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Anyway. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. In a day, how many of our words are we speaking the word of God? From when we wake up in the morning, the first words we say to when we go to bed at night. How many of our words? 1%? 2%? 10%? Are we speaking the words of the world? Because, listen, the world wants us to speak like them. They're constantly bombarding us with things, especially bad news. They're always bombarding us with bad news. The 24-hour news cycle would not sell if bad stuff didn't happen, would it? People want to hear about bad stuff. People want to talk about bad stuff. Oh, did you hear what's going on? You know, someone asked me the other day, does it look to you, does it appear to you like there are more natural disasters than ever before? And I said, no. It's just that we're aware of them all over the world. Before, we weren't aware of them. We didn't know what's happening over on the other side of the world. You know, in fact, one of our tribes here, I, I, I'm not sure which tribe it was, one of the Native American tribes here in South Carolina got totally wiped out because they saw the traders coming over and they would be trading, you know, their stuff and, the, 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 and they would be giving them, you know, whatever, they, whatever their furs or something from here. And they, they're smart and they realized these guys in the ships are the middlemen. We should just take our stuff wherever they came from and sell it ourselves and make more money. So the whole tribe got into their canoes and headed out into the Atlantic right into a hurricane. And the entire tribe was wiped out. I can't remember which tribe it was. Somebody might remember that if you studied history of South Carolina. Maybe it was the PD, something like that. Anyway, they didn't have a clue that there was a hurricane. In fact, it, it, that happened in uh, the Revolutionary War. I can't remember. I think it was the French fleet was wiped out down on the islands. They were, you know, fighting. Maybe it was the British fleet. British fleet. Hmm? The which ones? Suez? Okay. Out of trust. Thank you. So I knew somebody would know it, but you didn't really know it. You looked it up online, didn't you? I know you. <laughs> Sits there and, and gives us, like, like it's coming out of the computer brain. No, it's coming out of the computer fingers there, but thank you. Thank you. You know, you know in the, in, I, I understand that in the last uh, debate, there were fact checkers there that were only checking half the facts. But I live with a fact checker, okay? So I, you know, I know what it's like. Because, you know, you, know, you know what it's like to walk off the pulpit and you just think, man, I nailed it. I had, oh, the anointing was there. And then you hear something that you said wrong. The fact checker says, you know, and it's usually one of my stories, too. You know, when you used to tell that story, that didn't happen like that. When you used to tell that story, it had a different ending. And don't you start, Laverne. She's starting to bubble up. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Keep that in your mouth. The book of the law, the word of God. Speaking the word of God. But you shall meditate therein day and night. How many of us are meditating in God's will? Meditating in his word. His word is his will. Thinking about it. The word meditating actually means to, um, to growl, to roll it around. It's so funny. One of our puppies, you know, one of them talks to us all the time. The Scotty. He is constantly talking to us as if we can understand him. I mean, I'm not talking barking. Talking to us. He just comes in. Like if we leave him at home and we come back home, he's got to run up to us and, and lecture us. Why did we go away? You know, I, I assume that's what he's saying. We take him for a walk. In the middle of the walk, he stops, turns around, and starts talking. Like, I'm imagining he's saying, thank you, I'm really having fun out here. I love it out here. Our other one doesn't talk, but he communicates. I'm sound asleep, and he wants to go out. 
So he sits at the edge of the bed and goes, Arr, Arr, gives a little growl. Just like that, it's all he does. But I wake up. So that's, <laughs> so he's meditating, actually. Meditating in the word means to growl. It means to think about. It means to, in the Hebrew, it means all these things, to mutter. It means to mutter. Are we thinking about muttering the word of God in our hearts over and over? And he says, day and night. Day and night. It's not, all right, I, I, I just memorized it for five minutes. I'm done for the day. I'm good to go. It's day and night. This is a continually thinking and internalizing the word of God. That you may observe to do. Well, look at this. The basic bottom line here is think, say, do. Think, say, do. A simple formula. And now I know somebody say, oh, there he goes. He's got a formula for success. No, I'm telling you what God's word says. Think the word, say the word, do the word. You can't go wrong if you do that. Think the word, say the word, do the word. I'll give you an example. Jesus. Whatsoever I see the Father do, I'm going to do. He's a doer of the word. He went about doing good and healing all that were sick or oppressed of the devil. When the enemy came to him, he said, it is written. So obviously he's thinking about it. He's thinking it. He's saying it. He's doing it. He's our example. And the Bible tells us, for then, the then means after you've done. After. It's not like, wow, that's a great message. I'm going to prosper. No, it's after you've done what he said to do. Think, say, do. Then you shall make your way prosperous. That means you're going to have success, profitability. You're going to advance. This is all the Hebrew word here. You're going to go forward. You're going to progress. You're going to have profitability. Now, profitability is not just dollars and cents. You can do things, let's say, for your health that are not profitable. Right? You can do things like, like I mean, you may love banana cream pie, but that is not profitable for your health. Maybe a little bit of it, but not the whole pie. You can do things that are not, and you can do things that are profitable. If you do some exercise, do a little ex running, a little jogging, a little walking, even walking, it's profitable for your health. Cut back on some of the foods that we eat. It's profitable for your health. These are machines. How many of you would ever think of driving, um, guys, not ladies, guys, how many of you would ever think of driving your car without putting oil in it? Have you ever done that? The engine seizes up, gets overheats and seizes up, and you're, you're basically your engine is dead. It's just a big lump of metal in front of your car. You need to get it replaced. Well, our bodies are engines, engines of God, and we need to lubricate them. We need to keep them in top shape, and we need to make sure that what goes in is profitable. Now, what goes in is not just what we eat, but what we read and hear goes in and should be profitable to us. So he says, you're going to have prosperous and you're going to have good success. Now, did you ever wonder why it's double there? Pro prosper and success. Prosper and success. If you prosper, isn't that success? Success there doesn't actually mean what we think. Success there means perceiving and knowing, having wisdom. So he tells us that we're going to prosper, and that's going to be prospering in health, prospering in mind, prospering financially, and we are going to have the wisdom to make it happen. Have you ever heard of somebody who won the lottery one year and they ended up miserable? Even though they win millions of dollars, they end up miserable because they had the money without the wisdom. We had someone here in this area who, uh, bought, who, who won, a, won a lottery and built a whole new car uh, lot. Bought all the cars, did the lot, and then went bankrupt. Literally went bankrupt. So it didn't work. They had the money, but they didn't have the wisdom what to do with the money. Money does not make us happy. Knowing what to do with it may make us a little bit more happy. What's the first thing you do with it? You give to God. You give to God. You might say, man, I, I won in this lottery. I won all this money. I know I'm not, I'm not advocating you go out and buy a lottery ticket. If you do, just get the winning one and tithe, okay? Then you're okay. Then I'll give you my blessing. But, <laughs> hey, but 
you win, let's say you win this million dollars, and what's a tie? What's 10% of a million? 100,000? 100,000 dollars. And so you're there, and you're starting to write out your tithe check. What? And you just can't bring yourself to write all those zeros. So you say, man, I've never given this. I'm going to give Lord 10,000. The church should be happy to get 10,000. The church should be happy for this. Well, yeah, the church will be happy, but you're not going to be because you didn't bring your tithe to the Lord. Giving to God is one of the ways we ensure our financial success because to observe to do, what do we do? Everything he says. What does he say? Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Bring all your tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and I'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you don't have room enough to receive. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you begin to do things in the power of the Holy Spirit. On and on, doing whatever he says to do. I'm going to give you an example of this with Joseph and I'm turning back to uh, Exodus chapter 39. Because Joseph, he was in the worst of conditions, worst of circumstances. He lost his freedom. He's sold into slavery. He does not own himself any longer. He is no longer free. He belongs to somebody else. Literally, he is chattel that belongs to another person. He's a commodity. That person can take him and sell him to somebody else. And yet the Bible says in verse 2 of chapter 39, and the Lord was with Joseph. All right, take note. The Lord was with Joseph. How do we make sure the Lord is with us? Saying, thinking, doing the word of God. Saying, thinking, doing the word of God. He is with us. And he says, the Lord is with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Wait a second. How's that possible? He's a slave. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. The Lord calls him prosperous when he's in slavery. That's not going to do a whole lot for the whole reparations movement, is it? He calls him prosperous when he's in slavery. He's a slave. He was just bought by this guy, and the Lord says he's prosperous. Because prosperity transcends the money in your wallet or your bank account. Prosperity is a state of being with God that we are confident, secure, whatever state we're in, the Apostle Paul says, whatever state, to be independent of those circumstances, trusting and relying on God, and the amount of money in our bank account is not going to determine whether we're up or down, whether we're happy or sad, because we are depending on God, not depending on money, and we don't have a love of money, we have a love of God. When we learn to truly love God, we're going to learn to prosper. So it says that the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. A juxtaposition. Here he's a slave. He's got somebody who owns him, but he's prosperous. Which means that every single one of us, no matter how much debt we owe, no matter how much we have to do, we can prosper in all things in our life. Psalm number one, let's go there because it teaches us how to prosper. David. David tells us, step by step, how to prosper. Psalm 1. And it's, it's the, the do's and the don'ts here, really. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. He starts with the don'ts. Don't listen to ungodly advice. Number one, don't listen to ungodly advice. News. Television news is ungodly advice but I need to stay informed. Okay, stay informed. But don't feed on it. We become what we feed on. If you, if you uh, eat a lot of carrots, drink a lot of carrot juice, you know your skin is going to take on a little bit of the keratin and change color. You know that. It, it's, it actually does happen. What we feed on, we become. If we feed on television news, radio news, we're going to be like that. We want to feed on the Word of God. I'd rather be like Jesus. I was going to say a different, I, the, the whole Rolodex. You see, I don't have the computer brain. I have the Rolodex, and it was just spinning just now. I know you younger people don't even know what a Rolodex is, do you? you do you know what a Rolodex is, Alex? Say? No, I didn't think so. Sveta, Tim, you know what a Rolodex is? You guys know what a Rolodex is? No, they don't even know what a Rolodex is. 
Actually, I don't know what a Rolodex is. I'm too young. I'm sure Pastor Ray Beth told me what one is, though. She explained it to me. <laughs> so the Rolodex is spinning, and I'm going through Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, you know, all these old names. None of them work anymore, right? Blessed is the man that walks in the counsel of the ungodly, walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. We don't listen to ungodly advice. Why would you listen to an unsaved person telling you how you should live your life? Why would we do that? That doesn't make sense. God's word is a book of life. And it has all that we need for godliness and health and peace and prosperity. But we tend to I mean, you know what's really scary? There are a lot of people that get their life advice from TikTok. Now, that's really scary. Now, I don't advocate TikTok. I don't think anybody should have TikTok. It's a Chinese program, and they do absolutely have malware in it. And they, they're, anybody who has it on your phone, or, you know, it's in your phone already, you're, you're connected to the red Chinese, and they're just picking up data on you. So I would get rid of that right away. Don't get involved in that. But blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners. So you don't listen to the ungodly advice, and you don't hang out with people in sin. I can't tell you, there, there are times when we pray with people that are, they, they come up because they need prayer because of drugs or alcohol or something. They get set free. I mean, set free dramatically, supernaturally. No, no withdrawal. They're free. They're healed. And they go and they're coming to church and they're serving God and they're really going good. And then all of a sudden they fall, maybe six or nine months later. Not everybody, but sometimes. And I'll, 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 I'll get with them and I'll say, what happened? Well, I just wanted to go hang out with my old friends. Uh-huh. There it is. Stop hanging out with sin, people in sin. One time we used to go soul winning. And we go passing out tracts and soul winning on the streets of Georgetown in South Carolina. Not, I mean, Georgetown in Washington, not Georgetown, South Carolina. And we're passing out tracts and inviting people to church. And somebody said, I have a bar ministry. You know, that kind of pricks up your ears. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I like to go in and I sit there with them and I drink and, you know, and I share Jesus because nobody else is going to do that. <laughs> you got that right. Jesus didn't do that. So, I mean, let's take that to the logical extension. I got a porn ministry. I want to minister to all the people in the pornographic industry. Yeah, right. You're going to go be a porn star to minister to the porn stars? It doesn't work like that. When we're, when we're hanging out with sinners, we become like them. What we want is for them to hang out with us, more than one of us, with us. Because what we have is contagious, and they will catch what we have. That's Jesus. The spirit of the prophet leaps upon them, and they come into the things of God and the kingdom of God, and their lives are changed. Blessed is a man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So you don't listen to ungodly advice, you don't hang out with sin, and you don't put yourselves in judgment of others. This is so easy for church folks to judge others, to judge themselves to be so much better than others, so much smarter than others, so much holier than others, so much of a better person than others. And Jesus, he had a few words to say about that. He said, when you go to a feast, don't you go sitting up there in the top place. If I came to wash your feet, you should do this one to another. Jesus was very clear about people being pretentious in the things of God. He didn't like it. He said, yeah, do what the Pharisees say, but whatever you do, don't do what they do. Don't be like them. They stand and they say, Lord, can you imagine this prayer? Lord, oh yeah, probably because a lot of people pray something like this. Maybe not these exact words. Lord, thank God I'm not like that sinner over there. I serve you. I show up. I tithe. I'm a good person. That pitiful one over there, I'm not like him. And Jesus said, the one over there said in his prayer, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I've come short. Can you, can you just forgive me? And Jesus said that one was justified in the things of God. 
Jesus does not want us to be pretentious about our faith and about our holiness. He doesn't want us to be critical one of another. You know how it goes. Did you see what she wore to church today? Did you see the way he looked at her? And we're so judgmental of one another. Jesus says, I mean, the Bible says, not sit in the seat of the scornful. Let's not scorn one another. And certainly not the world. We can't expect the world to be like us until they are us. They're going to be the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And the, the Lord leaves us here until he returns for us to affect them, not scorn them. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Okay, um, the Rolodex just turned again. And I was going to say something about tattoos, but I decided not to. But there was a, you know, there's strip, strip clubs here in the, in the community. And there was one famous one years ago. And they all have comedians and they have music. They have, it's like a burlesque show. They have other stuff. And so there was a comedian, famous comedian. He was a comedian in Las Vegas, comedian in Miami, a comedian here. And, uh, of course, dirty. All these dirty jokes. All the golfers would come in to them. Anyway, um, I got a call from his sister one time. His sister was in North Carolina, lived in North Carolina, and said, uh, can you, they didn't know us, she didn't know us, she just knew we were at church, can you go and pray for my brother? He's dying of cirrhosis of the liver in the hospital. And I said, sure. Tell me what hospital, tell me his name. And she said, <clears throat> and he's the comedian at this club. I said, okay. She said, really, you'll go? I said, sure. She said, you're the fourth church I called. The first three wouldn't go. I said, well, I mean, isn't this what we expect? We don't expect everybody to be saved, right? We expect sinners to be sinners, and we'll go pray for them. So he went and prayed. He got healed. His, his uh, liver got healed, started functioning, got healed. He got released from the hospital. So now you have this comedian released from the hospital, and he's under a two-year contract, and he's coming to church. And so he makes an appointment to see me. He says, listen, Pastor Frank, I prayed with you, gave my life to the Lord, I got healed. He also got filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, um, I can't get out of my contract. I got to give two years. They won't let me out. They're, they're threatening to sue me. I said, so what are you going to do? He said, well, I have a clean act and I have a dirty act. He said, I will stop doing the dirty act and just do the clean act. He said, can I still come to church if I do that? I said, absolutely. So he starts coming to church and pretty soon I see these big guys that are bouncers. Now, Teresa's sitting back there. Raise your hand, Teresa. Her husband was one of those bouncers. Tattoos all over, biker guy. I just pictured him like swinging chains and stuff. Captain was his name. He's going to be with the Lord now. But Captain was one of those who got saved. And Teresa's with us to this day. And, uh, and he started bringing the girls in. And they were giving their lives to the Lord and getting saved. And this went on for a couple of years, two, three years. And after that time, he had a brain, I think it was a brain aneurysm, and he passed away. So they asked us to do the funeral. And that, it, it went into the newspaper. That this guy, the Duke of Dirt, was his tagline, had passed away. And all the clubs, all the, the comedian, all the clubs he worked in, and blah, blah, blah. And at the very end, it says, and he was a member of... Real life church. Well, don't you know the phone started ringing off the hook as soon as that obituary went into the newspaper. And people were yelling. I mean, they, you, our secretary would pick up the phone and, how could you let someone like that in your church? How can you? So I, they came to me and said, Pastor Frank, we can't take it anymore. We're getting all these hate calls. So I said, just simply tell them, isn't it amazing? Sinners come into church. It's amazing. It's It's phenomenal. We have sinners coming to our church. Anyway, it's a great funeral. I mean, nobody likes a funeral. I love this one. It was a great funeral because I hadn't seen so many gigantic guys crying their eyes out, accepting Jesus in my life. And for, for, for years after that, there were others that were coming in, and they were coming in from different clubs and around and get, giving their lives to the Lord. So... We're not scornful. We welcome, but we give them hope, something to change their life. 
Verse 2 says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. There it is again, the law. The law. Now we know he's referring to the Torah, which is the law of Moses, but God is a God of law and order. God is a God who, of law and order. And we are to do things lawfully. Not illegally, but lawfully. I say that and I chuckle on the inside that none of you are ever watching me when I drive. But lawfully. Not illegally. I commit, I'll try to be better. Last time we were in Italy, I was driving on the sidewalk. I'll try not to do that again. I promise. It's a true story. But it's, and it passed, oh, the people on the sidewalk are like jumping out of the way and yelling at me. I couldn't get off the sidewalk. It had these chains on both sides, and I couldn't find a way to get, get off the sidewalk. We, we, in the car, your family told you you're on the sidewalk. Yes, I know. I knew I was on the sidewalk. I was just <laughs> pretending I wasn't. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Let's get back to the Word of God. And in his law does he meditate day and night. Not in my driving on the sidewalk, but in his law does he meditate day and night. There it is again, meditating in the Word of God. And look what the result is. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither. Whatsoever he does shall prosper. There's the promise again. We're not going to get brown and dry up. We're going to prosper. Our leaf will not fall. We're going to stay green. We're going to have an unseen source, that river of life that gives us life. And whatever we touch will have life. We will prosper financially, prosper spiritually, prosper physically, mentally, and emotionally. Our relationships will prosper. Spiritually, we'll know things and hear things and see things that others don't as we move into the Spirit in a greater capacity. We delight in the Word of God. So the do's, I did the don'ts. Do, delight in the Word of God. Do we delight in the Word of God? Do we love to hear the Word of God, love to speak the Word of God, pray the Word of God, Meditate in the Word of God. Do meditate. Think on these things. And actually, Philippians 4, 8, if anything's true, if anything's lovely, if anything's good report, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, meditate. Think on these things. It's the same thing. Meditate on the Word of God. Think about the goodness of God. Think about the miracles of God. Think about the blessings of God. Think about how He's healed us, how He's performed in our lives, prospered us, how He hear, hears our prayer and answers our prayers. And number three, do something, right? He says, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He do, we do it. So he says, delight in the word, meditate in the word, and do something. Jesus told, and I think I preached on this on Thursday, whatever he says, do, do it. Right? Whatever he says, do, do it. Do it. Just do it. Do what he tells us to do. Amen? And then uh, I'm going to finish up with 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, one verse. Verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. How many people are discontent? We need to find our contentment in him. Money will not give us contentment. People are lulled into thinking it does doesn't. You've heard the old phrase, money doesn't buy happiness. You can have a lot of fun trying, though, but it doesn't buy happiness. It doesn't buy contentment. Only when someone is in the Lord are they truly content. Content means trusting God, knowing our needs are supplied, believing for more in Him, believing that we prosper, seeing us prosper, knowing that even when there's a critical situation, he meets our need. His meeting of our need is not dependent on the critical situation. It's dependent on our faith in him as we trust in him with all our heart. Lean not to our own understanding. He will establish our path. He will make a way. When there is no way, he'll make a way. It may be like a desert. He'll make a way in the desert. It may be like we're floods of water. He'll make a path in the water. He's demonstrated it physically, and he tells us spiritually he'll do just the same. So success in life must bring contentment. Not bring, well, yes, I've got several million, but I don't have enough. I need more. Contentment. 
Not content with lack, not content with debt, content with provision, God's provision. He will always provide whatever we need. It doesn't say he gives us everything, he gives us our needs. All our needs are supplied according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So no, we're not going to go without. No, we're not going to walk in lack. No, no we're not going to accept that we live below the standard. We are going to stand and trust God and believe God. He has called us to success. We started by saying, I wish above all things that we are successful and prosper in all that we do. Spirit, soul, and body, in Jesus' name, amen. Father, thank you today for calling us to success. And thank you, Father, for your anointing of success. Through the word of God and the spirit of God, that everything that you've spoken today will not come back to you empty, but it will bring back good reports from each individual who has received and believed and acts upon your word. Thank you for prospering us spiritually, mentally and emotionally, and prospering us financially, prospering us physically. That we have more than enough, overflowing as you are. In Jesus' name, amen.